Good morning. Welcome back to the Outreach of the Heart Ministries. I come to you live once again from the Sheetrock plant, south of Lovell, Wyoming. I'm inside the truck this morning because it is rather chilly outside. It's a little breezy outside, and it is a muddy mess outside due to uh, rain that fell yesterday and uh, through the night last night. So I'm inside the truck once again where it's nice and comfortable in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do have some really, really good news. Um, for those of you who know I stay out here on the road a lot, um, that's all by choice. It is up to me how long I stay out here. Anytime I, I want to make my way home, all I have to do is request that. Well, I made the request this week so that I can go home next week. Um, I should arrive home sometime on Thursday and be there through the weekend and into part of next week. I told my, my boss slash dispatcher that I need to put my feet on solid ground for a little while. It's been quite some time since I've been able to, since I've stayed home for more than just a 34 hour reset. And when you think about that, a 34 hour reset, that's most of that is nighttime hours of where you're sleeping. So I'm looking forward to it. It's been a while, and I'm getting tired. I'm really getting tired, and I know what this afternoon is going to bring forth is a lot of rest today and looking forward to next week and the week to come. But here we are now. This is an exciting time because, once again, we get to hear more about God's Word. And if you were tuned in last week, I kind of left us with, with this idea that maybe the Lord was going to make a series out of that particular topic. The topic was what happened that day in the Garden of Eden. And it hasn't become a series. But what we are going to do this morning is go back and look at one aspect. One aspect of what happened there in the garden. But I want to be able to recap all of that for you like it is a series here, just so you get a better understanding of what we talked about last week or maybe refreshed in your mind of what we talked about last week. And maybe something that you hear this morning in that recap will draw you closer unto the Lord. So, before we do that, would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the moisture that has fallen here in this place, um, this desert region of, of uh, Wyoming, Lord, and what a blessing it is. Uh, thank you for the blessing of being able to drive through the mountains this week, uh, avoiding driving in snow, but seeing a lot of snow up in the mountains, up in the peaks, and, and coming downward, Lord, in, in elevation. Winter, winter arrives early out here. What a stunning beauty the drive has been the last two or three days. Thank you, Lord, for that. Filling my eyes so that I could see your glory your majesty and be reminded of who you truly are. You are God and there is no other. Lord, I lift this message up to you to this day and ask that you bless it and bless those who hear it. And may, be, may it draw them ever closer unto you. I love you, Lord. I love you with all my heart. And it's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. So this recap of what we talked about last week, what, 
what happened there in the garden? Well, there were some things that I didn't even mention last week that I've been thinking about actually occurred there. But here are here are some of the things that or here are what we discussed last week. Well, as we read through Genesis chapter three, we find that evil entered the Garden of Eden, right? Evil entered the Garden of Eden. Evil being Satan in the form of a serpent. We find that Eve added to the words of God. God did not tell Adam that they were not to touch the tree. God stated that they were not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when Eve is conversing with the serpent or Satan, she adds to Scripture. She adds to what God had said. And she says, and we must not touch it or we will die. How often do we as human beings add to the scriptures? Or we subtract from the scriptures? Or we believe a part of the scripture and not a part of the scripture? We believe what we want to believe and we dis disregard the rest. That's not how God's word works. If one word of God's word is true, all of God's word is true. But we forget about that, don't we? We often forget about that. We talked about Adam being with Eve. And he ate also his disobedience to the Lord, but also his dishonor of his wife. Adam should have stood his ground on behalf of his wife and stood against the evil one, stood against this, this tactic of temptation, this tactic of Satan undermining God's authority and causing them to question God's authority. Does that still happen today? Men are not standing up for their wives. Men are cowering in the corner, not even standing up for themselves. And I made the comment last week that we even have men today that are pretending to be women rather than being men and standing up for the righteousness of God. Standing up in the righteousness of God and standing against the onslaught of the evil one. What a world we live in today. We talked about how their eyes were open to their spiritual nakedness, but also their physical nakedness. They tried to cover their evil or their sin. They tried to cover it themselves, but God made garments of, or coverings of skin to cover them, which we talked about maybe was the reference to the first sacrifice being made there in the garden. Then we go down, down, we're not going to cover all of these, but we get into some high points where Adam blames God and his wife. He doesn't take the responsibility of his own sin. He blames God and blames his wife. Eve blames the serpent rather than taking her own responsibility. God cursed the serpent. God punishes Eve. And then a death sentence, a death sentence sentence is established or is given and that's where we're going to start this morning with this death sentence because I think that probably left many of you a little bit confused what what's this death sentence well we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 2 
verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you not, must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, I want us to really look at how that is worded. For when you eat from it, it doesn't say now, Adam, if you eat from it. Now, when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, a lot of people might want to look at that and water it down and say, well, God told Adam that if, if he eats from this tree, he may die. He, 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 it might kill him. Or he may experience death. What is the significance of this death? Well, we read in the scriptures just previous to this that right next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the tree of life. Had Adam and Eve partaken from the tree of life, they would have lived forever. God gave them that opportunity. The tree of life was present to be chosen of for food and to be partaken of. And if Adam and Eve had actually partaken from that tree, they would have lived forever in the state in which they were in, which was a sinless state. God did not create Adam and Eve with sin already. Sin occurred as a choice that they made. And the sin was disobedience to God. They ate, they ate from the tree that God commanded them not to. As a result, God banished them from the garden so that they could not partake from the tree of life and then live forever in their sin. God watching out for them. But just think for a moment, if, if Adam and Eve had partaken from the tree of life, they would have lived forever. And I don't think, as a result of that, they would have ever partaken from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They would not have disobeyed. They would not have bowed to Satan's lies. But that's not what happened in the garden, is it? This command with a promise that God gave. Let's read this again. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The death sentence. Okay. Well, it hasn't happened yet, right? That's just God's warning. Does God give us the same warning? If you commit this sin, you will die. What's this death? For the wages of sin is death. For those who have not accepted the gift of grace or accepted their salvation, that sin results in death. Now, I'm going to have to explain this a whole lot deeper than I was expecting to because of how this is coming out. Christ came to this world. God sent his only begotten son, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son so that anyone who shall believe in him shall not perish or shall not die a spiritual death, but have eternal life. 
So if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are set free from that spiritual death. Because Christ took that spiritual death for us. He paid the price for us. His atoning blood covers that sin. And all sins, all sins of the world. So this is more geared towards those who have not accepted Christ. The sin that you commit still condemns you because there is no freedom from that condemnation until we accept Jesus Christ. It is there for our taking or our acceptance of, but so many people do not accept it. They know about it, but they don't accept it. Why is that? That is a very, very good question that only each individual can answer. So, sin entered into the world in the garden, right? In Genesis 3, verse 19, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now, this is after the sin has occurred. After the disobedience has occurred, God made this statement. When you eat from this tree, you will certainly die. Now he's carrying out his promise. A promise that we don't want to hear. We think of promises as being good things. But this is the promise of condemnation due to the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Condemnation that comes upon all of us. We're born with this condemnation. How do we know about this condemnation? We turn to the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 3. Verses 17 and 18. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, <coughs> Excuse me, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So condemnation is here, and the only one who can re relieve us from that condemnation or release us from that condemnation to set us free from that condemnation is Jesus Christ. And he has done that for all. All people. All people. Not just you, not just me, not just the person down the street, but all people. And the only way that that condemnation then that is placed upon us at our birth or at our conception is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. If we do not, we remain in condemnation. But when we accept our salvation, which is through Jesus Christ, we are set free. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. So what are we really talking about this morning? Well, we're talking about three judgments. The three judgments. And we've just discussed the first one. And that judgment is condemnation. And that began in the Garden of Eden. Okay. There's a second judgment. And there's a third judgment. And we're going to look at these next two in contrast with each other. Because this is a really big question out there in this, in this world of today. We've heard that scripture be misused. Judge not lest you be judged. In other words, people are trying to tell you, well, don't judge someone. Well, we do judge people with a righteous judgment that comes from the Lord. 
What happens, though, is we often judge people by their appearance, by their words, by their actions, not by their heart. How does God judge? He judges the thoughts and the actions of a person's heart. That is righteous judgment. We go by appearance. We go by actions. We don't necessarily look at why this person did such a thing that we feel we're worthy of judging. So there is a righteous judgment, and we as Christians are called to have a righteous judgment of others. And to call them out in that judgment. You're not comfortable with that. Well, I'm not very comfortable with it either. I'm not very comfortable with it either. So what about this judgment? That, that's our kind of judgment. But what about this? these second and third judgments? We've got the first judgment as condemnation, that it was established in the Garden of Eden. We've got the judgment seat of Christ, and we have the great white throne judgment. Now, we're going to open some scriptures here just to verify the two different events. They are separate events, and they're happening to different groups of people. We need to have this understanding very, very clearly. So, the judgment seat of Christ. Let's look at the book of Romans. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. All, all will stand before God's judgment seat. This is where there is a mass confusion. What does this word all mean? Well, if we read the scriptures prior to this, we understand that the Christians, the followers of Jesus Christ, The children of God are the ones being spoken of. All children of God will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If you are not a child of God, then you are an enemy of God. And therefore, the enemies of God will not stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's as simply as I can explain that to us. We look then at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10-15. through By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building upon it. For each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid. What is this foundation? It's the foundation that is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. This is the judgment seat of Christ, where our works, our good works, will be judged and thus given rewards. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though 
only as one escaping the flames. In other words, it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to come from the heart. It has to be an attempt to please God, not please ourselves. It has to be done with the right motives. It must be done to give God the glory and not ourselves. It being the good works. Now, don't get me wrong. These good works are not to earn our salvation, but they are because of our salvation. We do good works because of our salvation. We want others to experience the salvation that we have received or accepted. Is that your desire? Are you doing good works in the name of the Lord to draw others unto him? Well, let's look at one other scripture. It's out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we read verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, in the body, if we read up above, there's our earthly body, and then there's being outside of the body, being within the Holy Spirit. I don't want to get too deep into that because we've got a lot more other things to cover here. What I'm focusing on here is for we must all appear. All being whom again? The world wants to say, oh, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the scripture that they use in association with this belief. That we will all. Who is all? Does this mean the whole world? Every inhabitant of the world? Or is this just for the Christians, the followers of Jesus Christ? This is only for the followers of Jesus Christ. Those who are the children of God. Again, this is not for the enemies of God. Those who follow the things of this world rather than the things of God. That judgment or those people known as the non-believers or the unbelievers will face the white throne judgment. Okay, let's look at a scripture dealing with the white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20. Verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from its presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. If your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, or the book of life, you will not stand be before the white throne judgment. The only way your name is in the Lamb's book of life is if you are a child of God. If you are a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. The non-believers' names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, and thus they will be cast into the lake of fire. Or hell, as it's more commonly known. We look at another scripture. We turn back to Romans, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 
5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Verse 6, God will repay each person according to what they have done. The white throne judgment. The white throne judgment. So, as promised, we're going to look at these two in contrast with each other. So, who will stand before these two judgments? Well, believers will stand before the the Bema judgment or the judgment seat of Christ. The non-believers will stand before the white throne judgment. What is the purpose of these two judgments? Well, the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is to reward the faithful service of God's children. We will receive rewards. We being the followers of Jesus Christ, we who have accepted our salvation will be given rewards for the things that we have done. As we live out our salvation here on this earth. You remember what God says to us in the book of Revelation when he's speaking to the churches? about being lukewarm. I wish you were either hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Are you going through this life as a Christian, living out your salvation here on this earth? Nothing more than lukewarm. Or are you on fire for the Lord? How distasteful it is to God when we're just lukewarm. When we're only lukewarm. Take a a bottle of water that's been in the refrigerator and you drink of it and it's so cool and refreshing. It might even hurt your teeth. But it feels so good when it's hot out. But you go outside and you find this water bottle that's been left on the patio or out in the sunlight. And you take a drink of that and it's it's warm, it's it just tastes nasty. Do you guzzle that down like you would a, a cool drink of water? Probably not. Think about how it tastes to God when you are just lukewarm. Don't you want to just spit it out of your mouth? That lukewarm water. Black. How distasteful we as lukewarm Christians are to God. So, what is the purpose of the great white throne judgment? It is to settle the accounts of those who rebelled against God or refused to accept God for who He is and have chosen to follow the ways of this world. Those who have rebelled against God's righteousness and think that they, upon their own merit, their own righteousness, that they can get into heaven. Or they will escape punishment or God's wrath or God's condemnation, His judgment. So when are these two events going to occur? It's obvious they're two separate events. Well, the judgment seat of Christ occurs after the rapture, during the time of tribulation, which is that seven-year period of tribulation, and prior to the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ. So the judgment seat of Christ, those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we are caught up into heaven to meet Jesus in the clouds. 
We're not caught up into heaven. We're caught up into the clouds to meet Jesus in the clouds and then ushered into heaven. What a glorious day that will be. And then the preparation for the Bema judgment or the judgment seat of Christ begins as turmoil escalates down here on this earth for those who were left behind at the at the rapture. When does the great white throne judgment occur? It occurs after the thousand year reign of Christ, after the millennium period. So after the rapture, after the tribulation period, after the thousand year reign of Christ, the millennium, then the great white throne judgment occurs. What are the outcome? What is the outcome of these two judgments? Well, the outcome of the judgment seat of Christ is to receive the crowns, the rewards. What are those crowns? There's five different crowns that we're eligible to receive. The imperishable, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, and the crown of life. Those five crowns are available to us. And we will be awarded those crowns which God has established we are worthy of receiving. And Christ will present them to us at the judgment seat of Christ. What is the outcome of the great white throne judgment? My friends, it's not a glorious occasion. It's not a time of rejoicing. It is it is receiving your sentence where there is no defense. You have no defense attorney. There is no opportunity of an appeal. There is no way out of this judgment. So when the scripture says, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, it is at this point, as people beg for mercy at the great white throne judgment, They beg for mercy. They bow their knee. They confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it's too late. It's too late. And they're cast into hell for eternity. What a scary thought. But what a reality check. Because so many people that I I encounter are are waiting to see if this is all going to be real. I want to wait and see if the rapture really happens. Do you know how hard it's going to be to come to Christ and accept your salvation during the tribulation period? Do you want to be a martyr for that? You think it's tough in this world today? Wait until the the latter part of of the seven years the latter three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. Oh, I'll be able to do it. I just want to know that this is all real. Yes, there will be some that will come to know the Lord during the Tribulation period. But do you really want to wait? Do you really want to live through that Tribulation period? Oh, it won't be so bad can't be much worse than it is now. Have you read the book of Revelation? When God begins to pour his wrath out on humanity? Do you want to go through that? You don't have to. You have an option. You have a choice that you can make. Because of the the judgment that occurred in the Garden of Eden, For the wages of sin is death. But Jesus Christ paid that debt with his own death on that crucifixion cross. If we read out of 2 Peter chapter 2.
2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. Verse 8, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. What does this last scripture say? Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. He knows how to rescue us. He sent his son to rescue us. Not to rescue us from hell. As many people want to accept Christ as a substitute to going to hell. I don't want to go to heaven just because it's a substitute. I want to go to heaven because I want to live. I want to live in the presence of Almighty God forever and ever. I don't want to go to hell because that is in the absence of God forever and ever. The torment that we must feel. Those who stand before the white throne judgment and beg for mercy at the last moment. They bow their knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it's too late. Oh, the grief, the emptiness, the torment that must envelop them as they're sent into isolation in a place called hell. Oh, but I've heard some some young men and even some adult men say, yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to go to hell because that's where the party's going to be. No, it isn't going to be a party, my friends. It'll be far from a party. Well, I'll take my chances because what I know of heaven is a bunch of angels sitting around on clouds singing and singing and singing. Well, I can't sing and I'm afraid of heights. They make all kinds of excuses. What kinds of excuses do you make? I want to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city of gold, On each side of the river stood the tree of life. My friends, from the banishment from the Garden of Eden of Adam and Eve to prevent them them from eating from the tree of life and living forever in their condemnation, we read nothing, we see nothing, of the tree of life until here. The tree of life is once again in the presence of those who will spend eternity with God. The tree of life, which was once offered to Adam and Eve 
and is still offered to those who will accept their salvation. But we will not see that tree of life until we enter the glory of heaven. So folks, there is hope. There is hope. Jesus Christ is that hope. He is the one that removes that condemnation, that first judgment that has been cast upon the human race. Condemnation. And we've been given a choice to accept Jesus Christ. If we accept Jesus Christ, we will one day stand before him at the beam of judgment or the judgment seat of Christ, and we will receive our rewards for living out our salvation here on this earth for the things we've done right and the things we've done wrong. We will be judged. But the things that we have done wrong do not condemn us because Christ paid that penalty already. However, if we choose not to accept our salvation, we will one day stand before the white throne judgment. We have been given the opportunity to accept the payment that Jesus Christ made for our sins. For the wages of sin is death. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If we refuse to accept the gift of our salvation, God's grace, through Jesus Christ, we will stand before that white throne judgment and the sentence will be given. A sentence of continued condemnation in the lake of fire known as hell. So folks, there is hope. My friends, I hope, I hope that you will accept your salvation. But many, even hearing this message, will make the conscious decision to deny Christ as their Savior. They will reject the offer of salvation and make the fatal mistake and receive the judgment a sentencing of eternal death separation from God for eternity as they stand before the white throne judgment my prayer is that as you've heard this message it's been kind of it, it's a difficult topic to teach on especially when you're comparing and contrasting and trying to make it all make sense in just a, a short amount of time. But I pray that the Lord has, has brought you to a point where you understand it enough to make a conscious decision to accept your salvation because you understand that one day you will either stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive your rewards, rewards, or you will stand before the great white throne judgment and receive your punishment that is due. Now some critics are going to say, but Stace, Christ died for all. Yes, he did. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that anyone who shall believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The contrast to perish or to have everlasting life. For anyone who shall believe in him do you believe in him? Do you believe in him enough to surrender your life to him?
the French tomorrow may be too late. That event that's spoken of, known as the rapture, can come at any moment. Will you meet Jesus in the clouds? Or will you be left behind? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. What a somber, somber message this morning. But it's based on what you taught us last week of the things that occurred in the garden. Or there's a lot of things that occurred in the garden. One of those being the peace that Adam and Eve had. After they sinned, that peace was removed from them. And we know this because they were hiding from you. They were hiding from you. And Lord, so many people are still hiding from you, or at least trying. And as they try to hide from you, the peace that they are not living in is so horrifying. I can't even understand it, Lord. Why do they choose to live outside of your grace? Outside of your peace, outside of your joy. Why, Lord? It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.